Well, hey, family, I hope that wherever you are right now, that you are safe, that you are somehow experiencing God's kindness in the midst of this collective trauma. Uh, before we jump into the word today, uh, particularly for those of you who are joining us for the first time or uh, maybe not have been with us long, I want to ensure that we are all playing from the same playbook with respect to who Renovation Church is. You see, Renovation Church was founded uh, upon the biblical idea that a church should reflect the full creative genius of the Lord and every type of person that he has made, every color, every creed, every context, every education level, uh, every economic level, every ethnic expression, that that should in, be embodied in the body. Renovation Church was founded upon the principle that the gospel is not just the vertical axis of the cross, the understanding that uh, we receive Jesus' righteousness in place of our sin, but that the gospel broadly and more fully, uh, in fact, involves the horizontal axis of the cross and understanding that the gospel requires us to pursue the flourishing of all human beings. And within the pursuit of the flourishing of all human beings, it means that we stand and we fight for justice. Now here in the West and specifically in the United States, there is a hollow gospel, a gospel that promotes salvation, but forgets flourishing. And we will not support that gospel. And we will never be that church. And I'm saying this to you at the top of my message so that when you hear me say the word gospel over and over and over again, as I preach Paul's words today, that you understand that when I say gospel, I don't just mean Jesus work on the cross for the salvation of individual human beings. It is Jesus work on the cross for the salvation of the world, for the reconciling of all things back to himself to make all things new, which means that here and now, as the gospel is proclaimed, it must be proclaimed in a way that the kingdom has broken in and the requirements of the kingdom is that we fight for mercy and for justice. We cannot preach a hollow gospel, live a hollow gospel and say that we are reflecting God's desire for the world or for the flourishing of people. And I wanted to ensure that we were all on the same page as we pursued God's word together today. So if you would go ahead and open up your paper or digital Bible to first Corinthians and we will be in chapter nine. Once again, as you turn there, here's one question I would like you to ponder. Are your rights more prized than the gospel? There it is the first time again. First Corinthians nine, 12 B through 18. Hear the word of the Lord. Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple and those who serve at the temple are, are at the altar rather share in what is sacrificed on the altar in the same way the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel get their living by the gospel. But I've made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing this so that they may be applied in my case. Indeed, I would rather die than that. No one will deprive me of my ground of boasting. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting for an obligation is laid on me. And woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I'm entrusted a commission. What then is my reward? Just this that in my proclamation, I may make the gospel free of charge so as to not make full use of my rights in the gospel. Pray with me. Father, would you help our hearts receive the word now with gladness and with joy? Would you transform us? And more than that, would you transform the soul of this nation? Because God's people demanded that things be different. We ask this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost and all God's people said together, amen. There is no pandemic exception to the Constitution of the United States or the free exercise clause of the First Amendment. 
Plaintiffs have demonstrated that they are likely to succeed on the merits of their free exercise claim concerning the Assembly for Religious Worship provisions in Executive Order 138, that they will suffer irreparable harm absent a temporary restraining order, that the equities tip in their favor, and that a temporary restraining order is in the public interest thus. Having considered the entire record and governing law, the court grants plaintiffs motion for a temporary restraining order. This is the written interpretation of the ruling from a federal judge concerning the lawsuit by several conservative church leaders in North Carolina against North Carolina's Governor Roy Cooper. The suit asks that the court throw out Governor Cooper's restrictions on indoor religious services. The suit argued that Governor Cooper's guidelines restricted their constitutional rights to worship freely. As you can tell from the ruling, they won successfully fighting Governor Cooper's executive order limiting indoor church services. And they received a temporary restraining order against the governor's guidelines, freeing them from adhering to it for at least 14 days. Though it has been proven that indoor worship gatherings have been hot spots for the virus and health experts continue to warn that large groups sitting in enclosed spaces for long periods of time are much more likely to cause the spread of COVID-19, the suit went through and physical gatherings will proceed with those churches. My friend, Jerome Gay, who pastors a thriving church in North Carolina, posted the article detailing the outcomes of the suit and he wrote this. This is not a good witness for the church. We must remember that people who are not Christians are watching how we handle this situation. This is not a political issue. We must place the safety of the members of our churches in high regard. I found his response particularly inspiring because as he faced the moment before him, he was essentially given the green light to gather physically because of the lawsuit instigated by others. And instead, he chose to see the moment through the lens of what is most important, the gospel witness of Jesus people for him and many others. Listen, the witness of the church is more important than the rights of the church. Now. I want to be careful here and say that I do not want to sow any seed of division or judgment on anyone who has chosen to gather physically. These are trying times for all leaders and particularly for church leaders. And we need to be praying diligently for the entire church, not just renovation church. There are significant, seemingly no win decisions to be made and all of us will be making wrong and right decisions. My sharing about North Carolina's situation and Jerome's post has nothing to do with the decision to gather physically itself and everything to do with the why of it. You see, the why of it was in direct defiance of the governor's orders with respect to what he felt he must do in order to keep as many citizens as possible healthy and safe. The why of it is the activation of a lawsuit against the authorities under the guise of religious rights being violated in the midst of a global pandemic and a global upheaval against the continued and systematic dehumanization of black people in this nation. The why of it is their willingness to put their rights ahead of what is most important, their witness to a watching world. And as much as I would like to wash my hands of it and judge it with impunity, I know that I have at one time or another been guilty of the latter. And at some point, so have we all. Our rights often get in the way of what's most important. I could spend precious time here naming examples of those rights we often place in front of what is most important. But I imagine with just a few moments of thought, you could quickly surface two or three of your own. Our right to relax, make us tune out our kids. Our right to be heard allows us to talk over others. Our right to be safe enforces a subtle desire to ignore entire populations of people. Our right to a quiet life allows us to close our eyes to the brutal history and grotesque reality that has shaped and shapes the soil and the soul of our nation. And for the Christian, our rights often and specifically get in the way of our witness. Yet what we have before us in Paul's letter is an invitation to a higher plane, if you will, a declaration of sorts that that through the way he both lives his life and instructs his young church plant, your rights must not impair your witness. No matter what your rights might be, they must not impair your witness of the gospel. 
And in order to make this point, Paul goes to great lengths using some fairly intense language. And my hope is that we would heed his words, knowing that it will be well worth it. Now, listen, last time we were together, we arrived at this glorious truth that life is more than right. Paul's words are beautifully contradictory in this section of his letter. He has made an incredible appeal to his first readers that he was entitled to certain rights and that even the scripture supported his claim. And so the logical conclusion after making such a claim would have been for Paul to demand then for the Corinthians to ante up and financially support him the way that they rightfully should and the way that they owed him. Instead of meeting their expectation once again, Paul takes a turn. Hence the word or phrase rather beautiful contradiction. You see, despite all of his arguments, which were very clearly establishing his rights as an apostle, specifically his right to financial support, Paul pens in verse 12b that he has made no use of these rights. He will not. In fact, we said that the way of Jesus is to relinquish our rights for the flourishing of others. Jesus people relinquish their rights for the flourishing of others. This is the way. And there is a glaring moment before us to submit our rights for the flourishing of others. Why? Because rights detached from the consideration of communal good make us wrong. And knowing one's rights is only half of the equation. Knowing when to exercise them and when to relinquish them is the rest. Paul's argument could have ceased here. And yet there's more, a great deal more. You see, he insists that there is more to his choosing to relinquish his rights than the common good of others. There is more at stake than the flourishing of other people. The gospel itself and all of its implications is at stake. He uses strong language here. Paul would endure anything to avoid putting an obstacle between another person and the good news of the gospel. Hear it again, anything. Can we just let that sink in for a moment? When I read Paul's words, what first came to mind for me were the many things that I put up as obstacles to the gospel. My preferences, my time, my fear, my doubt, my unbelief, my boredom, my rights. There are a plethora of things, if we can be honest for just a moment, that we either passively allow or actively instigate that become obstacles to the gospel. Can we be honest together? Can we examine our hearts just for the next 30 seconds and earnestly think on the things that we allow and instigate that have been obstacles to the gospel, both in our own lives and the lives of others? Paul's words echo back to the previous chapter, do they not? As he insisted that the Corinthians consider, 1 Corinthians 8, 9, that their choices and behavior could potentially become a stumbling block or an obstacle to the weak amongst them. For reasons yet to be explained, Paul is convinced that any exercise of his rights, specifically his right to accept financial support from the Corinthians, would create barriers for his work of sharing the good news of the gospel. In other words, no right is worth hindering or hampering the work of the gospel. Paul is so emphatic about this point that he says he would rather die, verse 15, than. Interestingly, the sentence in the Greek literally sputters to a stall. It halts. He would rather die, dot, 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 than what exactly? He would rather die than have his rights become an obstacle to the gospel. He would rather die than become a stumbling block to anyone seeking the presence and favor of the Lord. Paul does not quite finish his thought. He instead blurts out, as it were, that no one will deprive him of his boast. His boast, you might be wondering. Yes, his boast. Paul explains. You see, despite all of the incredibly impressive reasons he has for claiming his rights and receiving support, Paul will do no such thing because to do so would rob him of his claim to be working voluntarily as an apostle. It is important for us to understand that Paul did not fit neatly into their categories. This is in part the heart of the tension. Paul was a freelance missionary. The Corinthians, on the other hand, would have compared him to the familiar philosophers in their world and their worldview. There's a connection here if you can get it. In the Corinthian world, there were four acceptable means by which philosophers would support themselves. The philosopher could charge a fee for their teaching, as the group called the sophists did. 
Or the philosophers could personally be supported by a wealthy patron and become their resident intellectual, living within the walls of the patron's household and even instructing the patron's children. But those means came with an obvious loss of independence. The third option was the philosopher begging on the street. And the last option was the philosopher working a trade and thereby supporting themselves. This, though, had the disadvantage in culture of recurring an automatic low status, which we'll cover more in detail next time. But Paul is determined by his choices to make clear the difference between being a laborer for the gospel, for the church of Jesus, the Messiah, and being some traveling dispensary of man-made wisdom. Paul would not be paid for the gospel only to find himself invited into an exclusive relationship with the upper class amongst the Corinthians. This was not the gospel work. It is not how it work. It still doesn't work that way. The gospel is for everyone. Paul contended not just for those who could afford it. Paul also felt that he had a weighty obligation to share the good news of the gospel. Verse 16. His boast is that he has no boast because he is compelled to tell the world of what God has accomplished in Jesus. Woe to me, Paul writes, if I do not proclaim the gospel. Now, passages like this scare the heck out of us, don't they? Yeah, they do, because nobody wants to put the words obligation and gospel together. But here they are. For fear of creating a culture of quote unquote works righteousness, there has been nearly a generation of preaching that has avoided or rebranded the idea that when you are a follower of Jesus, there are obligations attached to how you live your life. Or to quote Jesus, if you love me, you will do as I command. And again, as he said to his last and first followers, rather with respect to their calling in this world, teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Sharing the gospel, then, is an obligation, not an option. And removing every possible obstacle between the gospel and another is an obligation, not an option. And fighting for justice is an obligation, not an option. And the refusal to do so is an obstacle between others and the gospel. Now, from where did Paul get this sense of obligation? From where did it arise? Well, perhaps Paul was well versed in his utter indebtedness to Jesus. After all, Paul had been a terrorist, a persecutor of the church. And when Jesus rescued Paul from his bitter, broken and angry life, he commissioned him to tell non-Jewish people specifically about Jesus. Paul, in other words, had no choice. Paul preached from necessity. It is reminiscent of the ancient prophet Jeremiah's words that the good news about God is something like a burning fire shut up in my bones, Jeremiah 29. Paul wanted to obey Jesus from the well of love that bubbled up in him for Jesus. This is why obligation as it was, it is an obligation of delight. His witness was a gift, not a burden. And when we know the love of Jesus and the love of Jesus from that love, we cannot help but tell others of that love. We will not be constrained. More still, we will ruthlessly obliterate any obstacle between anyone and an opportunity to hear who Jesus is and what he has done. What God accomplished in Jesus was removing every obstacle between his beloved children and himself. This is the good news that though people put obstacles between themselves and the father, obstacles of self-worship, obstacles of mistrust, obstacles of unbelief. God moved toward us. He pulled down every obstacle in Jesus. Jesus died on the cross in our place for our self-worship. Jesus trusted the Father completely so that his faith can be ours even when our faith falters. Jesus rose in power, defeating death and ensuring that anyone who believes in him will have unhindered access to the Father and life forever. Jesus ensured that nothing could separate us from the love of God, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Every obstacle has been removed. And all we have to do is put our trust in him. It is this understanding of what God has done that pushes us to eliminate every obstacle and that so drove Paul that he would do nothing to rebuild what God had already torn down. There's a word in there for somebody right now. 
And given that Paul has no choice but to be a witness of this good news, his reward is paradoxically to ensure that he offers the gospel free of charge to any and everyone, thereby relinquishing his rights, verse 18, for the sake of the gospel. In offering the gospel free, free of charge, Paul owns his ministry of living and reflecting the way of Jesus and the gospel himself. His renunciation of rights enables him to share in Jesus' own sacrificial life, which gives Paul a share of the life-giving blessing of the Father. Paul leverages one more illustration here to make it clear just what he is giving up. Those who work in the temple, Paul writes in verse 13, eat of the food of the temple. Paul is referring here to the temple of God in Jerusalem and to the fact that the priests in God's temple would get a share of the sacrificial meat. And finally, dropped in as almost an illustrative afterthought, Paul plays the big joker for my space fans. And he quotes Jesus from Jesus' own words in verse 14 and says that those who labor in the gospel should make their living by the gospel. But Paul has decided that though the laborer is worthy of his or her wages, his worth was not worth any hindrance of the gospel. He has laid down his right even to a living wage for the sake of God's gospel, reaching as many people as possible. And what we will see next time is that he was willing to do still more. He was willing to cast any and everything possible aside so that people might experience the fullness of the gospel. My life and the way I live it at times has been an obstacle to the gospel. My rights have been an obstacle to the gospel. There, I said it. Now you can follow suit. You see, in just a few words, Paul has pointed out two things with which we must contend, or at the very least, two questions we must ask ourselves. What rights am I unwilling to relinquish for the sake of the gospel? What in my life is an obstacle to the gospel reaching the hearts of all whom I encounter? Paul had his answer. He was willing to relinquish anything, even a living wage. And the primary obstacle with which he was concerned was the very thing he was willing to relinquish. I would not go so far as to say it is more complex for us, but perhaps it might require more digging. Digging into our hearts and into our minds, into the collective history with honesty that might leave us a little low and in need of grace, but truly free us to the life that God would have for us. If we find ourselves constantly defending our rights, then we lose sight of the gospel. That is it. This is why the message matters for us. Submit your rights to your witness. Submit your rights to your witness, not the other way around. Both the necessity Jesus people have to eliminate any obstacle between others and the gospel and the obligation Jesus people have to proclaim the gospel should cause us to consistently evaluate the nature of our witness and the impediment of our rights. And so all that is left for us to do is respond. And so first I invite you to abandon any sense of guilt or shame. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. We have all placed our rights over our witness of the gospel. We have all cast aside our obligation of delight. But today it's a new day. And so we repent to the father together for the ways that we have placed our rights over our witness and ask him to help us lay down anything that might be an obstacle between the gospel and another, even if it's costly. Also invite you to ask God for the daily opportunity to tell someone about Jesus in word and deed and ask him that your obligation of delight would truly be just that. Pray this prayer, maybe. God, help me to lay down anything that impairs my witness. God, give me an overwhelming desire to tell others about Jesus. For those of you who do not yet follow Jesus, you are invited to repent today as well of trusting yourself more than you trust God who loves you. Repenting means to turn into a new direction. And that new direction for you today is toward God and away from those things that prevent you from giving him the whole of your life. 
When you do this, Jesus will transform your heart so that you believe that he is who he said he is. And he did what scripture says he did. Believe that he indeed relinquished his rights, including the right to life, so that by believing in him, you might live life to the fullest. Here's the question. Will you place your trust in him today? If you sense that leading at all, then I want you to pray this prayer with me, not necessarily aloud, but with your whole heart. Father, help me to believe. Help me to see that Jesus gave up his rights and gave up his life so that I might have his righteousness, so that I might have his life. Become my savior today, Jesus and my Lord. Transform my heart so that I might follow you fully and give me an understanding of the fullness of the gospel, not just for what it transforms in me, but for what it should transform in the world. In Jesus name. Amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer in faith after our gathering, please, please contact one of our pastors or one of our leaders or one of our prayer team and let us help you take a next step into life with Jesus and life with his church. You know, I wish I could tell you all that Pastor Jerome's commentary on the lawsuit in North Carolina and the endangerment of our gospel witness was received well by all. Unfortunately, it was not. There in the comments section of his post, he was chided, called a Democrat as though that was automatically antithetical to being a Christian and told that there was no safety issue and that he was, in fact, neglecting a salvation issue, it grieved me deeply, both for him as my friend, but greater still at what it means for the church. Renovation, what type of movement could we be a part of if our rights never got in the way of our witness? If there was nothing, nothing we were willing or unwilling rather to relinquish in order for the gospel to flourish, for people to flourish. If we actually delighted in our gospel witness and it was a delightful obligation, I'll tell you the type of movement we'd be a part of. We'd be a part of a movement that could literally change everything. We'd be a part of a redemptive, prophetic, powerful church that actually stood in the gap for those who most desperately need the gospel. We will be a part of a movement that would change the world before our very eyes. And I don't know about you, but I cannot wake up and live for anything less than that. I love you. We are in this together and we will not stop. God bless you all. I hope to see you soon.